All right, beauties. I am honored to be joined by Kesh, who rarely does interviews, but is such an iconic person overall. But just like the beauty, I'm I'm very excited for this conversation. It's so nice to meet you finally. I know, I know. I've been I've been watching you and admiring you from afar for such a long time. Now before I got here, I was like, I need to know what Kesh is going to wear, what the look is going to be giving. Have you always been the person that people are like, what's she going to wear? I think that's always been a way for me since school, probably. I've definitely expressed myself through my clothing since a young age, for from sure. From a young age. And did that come from your parents? Like, where did that come from? You know, it's hard because my parents don't really, they're not really extroverted in that way. So for me, I think it's just a natural expression and just something that came through like exploration and just, you know, living within my own skin and and experiencing the world in the way that I did. Yes. Well, you grew up in Croydon. Yes. Tell me about the beauty culture there. What was, what was your early life like? I think... For me, the beauty culture in Croydon, it's it varies so much because there's so many different communities. It's a very multicultural space. So I think it's hard to like pinpoint one kind of like identity of it. But for me, I think Croydon culture is, has influences of like very much like Jamaican culture and Indian culture, Pakistani culture, Eastern European culture, traditional British culture, like all mixed together to like just create one kind of blended, like coexisted expression. So I think for me, that's what it was growing up. And you kind of pull from your own family history and your own, you know, your own kind of like cultures and then blend it in with what was happening in England at that time. So it was a a little bit of like a rude girl expression is what we like to call it, which really has like a lot of roots within like Jamaican culture. So like slick back baby hair, like track suits that can come from like anywhere from, you know, British like football culture to kind of Eastern European working culture. And I think just blending all of those together creates this very like distinctive British look. And that's what was like, that's what I was doing growing up. Is there anything that I would know from Croydon, like any people or like I'm trying to like imagine it, like are are there any signifiers or people from that area that I would know? Well, I think two people that come from Croydon or from South London, Croydon's just next to South London is uh, Naomi Campbell. Oh, yes, of course. And Kate Moss. Oh. So two of the biggest supermodels in the world. What's in the water um, over there? I know, I wonder, right? (laughs) Um, So both of them, I believe, are from, I believe Kate's from Croydon and I believe Naomi's from South London. So it's interesting. I think those for me were two pretty big beauty icons growing up, knowing that, you know, they just came from like 15 minutes away from where I'm from. Yes. So you're a teenager. You're figuring out your self-expression and how you want to Mm self-present. What about that process was empowering and what about that process was frustrating at times? I think growing up in a place like England as a young black slash brown girl you know I think there was frustrations in that space because you're not necessarily appreciated for who you are fully Mm. you're facing a lot of obstacles just in your daily experience and it's kind of harder to find your truth in that space when you're constantly up against kind of these negative experiences that make you question you know your beauty and your identity and your sense of self Mm -hmm. so I think it was really hard to kind of navigate within those landscapes at first but you know from all of those experiences of pain there comes so much beauty as well and it allows you to kind of defy what is expected of you because you're kind of existing within your own space so I think for me I was able to experiment a lot more and kind of find the version of myself that made the most sense for me because of, you know, those experiences. Yeah. Now, you are an artist. Yes. First and foremost, mm-hmm. and that art takes various forms, visual art, design, music, of course. Mm-hmm. Have you always identified as an artist? Have you ever had a boring corporate job? <laughs> I had two jobs. Really? Tell me about you working a job. I'm so curious to know what the jobs were. Oh my gosh, it's so funny. I was 16 years old. I was plotting to leave my town because I'd had enough and I needed to get out. But the only way I could get out was uh, if I had money to do so. So I eventually said, fine, I'll get a job I don't want to do this but I'm going to do it and in my town it's a small town there weren't very many opportunities my first job I was a cleaner 
Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. I used to be a cleaner for a gym. So every day after school, I'd finish school at 3.35, go home, I'd watch Dragon Ball Z (laughs) for 15 minutes, (laughs) I'd amp myself up and be like, okay, I'm going to go clean this gym. And I'd go to the gym and I'd work my three-hour shift and I would clean. And it's funny because, like, I'm really not that great at cleaning. I was going to ask, are you good at cleaning? No, not really. I, like, don't like to do it. But obviously you have to do it. But, yeah, for a job, I was cleaning this gym and I would clean the lockers, I'd clean the bathrooms, I'd clean the toilets, I'd clean. I know, it was, like, to think back on it, it's quite funny, but... I was cleaning this gym and I was cleaning it with such intention of being like, this is my way out. And it was like, I think it was worse than minimum wage at this point. Mm. So it's like the money that I was actually saving, I don't know where I thought it was going to get me, but (laughs) I did end up doing that job. My first job, I was a cleaner. Then I got fired because I wasn't a good cleaner and (laughs) um, I wasn't mad. And then I went on to work at a company where I had to sell windows. Like... (laughs) I know, it was so random. I was, um, like, at the call centre, basically, and there was, like, 20 people at a table, like, cold-calling people, trying to convince them to, like, buy windows for their house. (laughs) Obviously, I was terrible at that. You got... That was the worst pay I've ever had, but you would get a commission if you could get, like, a lead or get someone to, like, you know, like, buy a new set of windows for their house. I didn't make one sale. It was (laughs) awful. I couldn't do it. I couldn't, like, commit... I couldn't like commit to like fake selling, you know. Of so course, yeah. Those are my two jobs at 16 years old, and then at that point, I realized, wow, I cannot do this. This is like right. not for me. I gotta like, I gotta get out. I was already side hustling by like drawing people's names on their clothes in school, and like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, in school we wear um, in England we wear school uniforms, so we would have like blazers with collars, and after school. We thought it was so cool. You'd, like, pop your collar after school and, like, walk home. And I would, like, graffiti people's names on the back of their collars and things like that for money. So I already had, like, the two experiences of, like, I'm making money like this and I'm making money like this. Which way do I really want to do it? Right. And I want to make money through my creativity. Yeah. So I was like, this stuff's not for me. Like, I'm going to go this way. And then, you know, through kind of a chain of events, I got myself to London and then that's how I started to, like, exist and make money and support myself. And really get into the creative community. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this whole time, what are your parents? Are they encouraging you to do this? Yeah, I'm really lucky, actually. Like, my parents are immigrants. The parents that raised me are from Trinidad and the Caribbean and then Malaysia. So Because you were adopted. Correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so I was adopted at, like, age four. Um, my mom and dad, who who I consider to be my mom and dad, mm-hmm. you know, it, in those cultures, it is very much the norm for for your parents, especially immigrant parents, to want you to have like a, a job, stable a job. stable job, yes. like a guaranteed yeah. job. Like if you go and you study at medical school, or you know, to be a lawyer or an accountant or any of these things, you're almost if you can pass then you're guaranteed to have a job, right? So it's more of like a guaranteed job. But my parents, my mother worked in the medical field. She's, you know, a midwife. And my dad worked within, you know, accounting and financial advising and things like that. So it's like both of those jobs they had to study for and go through the system. And they had really, really hard challenges and hard lives to get to where they were. And I was lucky enough to have, for them to not put too much pressure on me. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I'm really, really lucky for that. There's not much that they could offer me in terms of, you know, me and my mum were talking about this the other day. She she was like, you know, there wasn't much we could give you in terms of your career choice, but we always have you know, believed in you in some some way. They yeah. they knew I was an artistic child and a creative child. Yeah. So they kind of just stood back and said, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And gave you that freedom. I discovered you on Tumblr, as mm-hmm. I'm sure many people did. And it's so funny because you were such an originator of so many trends and you were so ahead of your time. I mean, you're still like, ahead. I feel like you're like living. It's like we're in 2023. Which year do you think you're in? You're like in 2033, <laughs> 2043. I can't say what year I'm in I think at this point I'm just like transcending space and time and just existing within whatever it is in this current moment you know (laughs) that feels absolutely right for you transcending space and time 
When you were on Tumblr and putting your work and your images on Tumblr, what was that early experience like for you and what drew you to the platform? I think that Tumblr was, you know, just another kind of place to express myself. I think that, you know, Tumblr was a while ago. It's like at that point I was just in such a hyper expressive state. It's like no matter where it was, I just wanted to put that out into the world and and connect really. Yes. You know, I really wanted to just connect with like minded people or other creatives or just really get things off of my chest because yes. creativity is my form of therapy in a way. Yeah. It's really a way for me to just get things out of my head and get things out from my heart. And I, I just had a light bulb moment as you were speaking about that. I feel like I'm kind of in that phase now of just wanting to create content all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of like going with it because maybe there's going to be a time that I don't want to turn an afternoon into like a little mini vlog. But mm -hmm. for right now, something is like pushing me to do that and put that out on the internet. Yeah. And yeah. I think, yeah, I can I can see that. I see your content. I see the stuff you do. And it's, it's really beautiful oh, what you're doing. You. I thank think... You. You know, a lot of us are enjoying that expression, like your your beauty of your life and your mm -hmm. perspective. I mm -hmm. think it's cool. And I noticed that, you know... Yeah, that impulse to share. The impulse like, to share. It comes from inside and then you, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I used to have that. I don't have that anymore. Well, you're much more private now. I am. Yeah, I which am. we'll talk about. But yeah. I'm, but so in that time, you were really feeling like, I want to put myself out there, share things. It was like this, you had to do it. I had to. It was just coming straight from the source of like, mm -hmm. this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm sharing. This mm -hmm. is what I'm doing. This is what I'm sharing. And I think that maybe a day will come where you do become a little bit tired of it or you do decide to step mm -hmm. back a little bit and just focus on things in a different way and mm -hmm. I think that really served its time and its purpose for me and it was in that state of connection and it was in that state of I think the landscape of the internet and social media was very different then very I think we weren't really relying so much on algorithms mm -hmm. I think for me the algorithm has also made me step back a little bit and realize that not realize but question how safe these spaces are for me you know as a woman as a woman of color as an artist, as somebody that's independent, as somebody that is not necessarily fueled by the machine. It's like I'm I'm existing within a very independent space. So I question mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how I share now. Yes. And I think I'm just very much in my phase of questioning. I still do stories and I still mm -hmm. post. I'm still there. I'm still present. But I just think for me it's like how present do I necessarily want to be until the next project. Yes. Yes. Using it as a tool for a larger piece of artwork that you're that you're sharing. Now, I would also imagine as a creative who is so ahead of trends, there also must be the sensitivity towards putting out something and then someone, you know, you're on the mood board, but it's not inspiration. It's like a direct copy. And I know you and your own career have dealt with like IP issues. Mm -hmm. Are you open to talking about that? Yes, I am. For me, at first, it was difficult because as a young artist, as an independent artist, you really want to have visibility. You want to have your moment. You want to have the community. You want the support. And I think when you hear that you're on the mood board for these artists, I wouldn't say bigger artists. I would just say more, more visible, mainstream, more, more mainstream. Visible. Yep, yep. You know, I think that it can become frustrating because ultimately what you're doing as an artist is like you're expressing your heart in that moment for me anyway I mean everybody's mm -hmm. different personally I think true art is expressing your heart your soul your spirit and the things that you want to say in that moment and everything that you're doing is a reflection of that so when you realize that oh well that part of my conversation or that part of my expression or that part of the thing I'm trying to say right now is being utilized for shock factor or financial gain or as some sort of just calling card without actually the thought behind it mm -hmm. it can be frustrating but now I've made peace with it you know because I mean I couldn't be more happy with the way that I create my work yeah I think that way of creating is like there's a lack of spirit to it sure and I think creativity is a very divine experience and mm -hmm. I think that can be forgotten especially as we move into this like hyper corporate landscape and I'm not opposed to corporate because I have worked within corporate spaces right. I mean before. Your, your American apparel collaboration was probably one of it was everywhere I mean yes. it was 
huge. What was the scale of that collaboration? It was much bigger than I, not that I expected, but what we intended. We intended to just do one release during the summer. And I think because it just, it sold out within like the first day. So then the company wanted to do more. And I thought, well, if people want it, and, you know, I was getting such positive feedback from the community and, like, mm-hmm. from, like, other artists and people and, and and supporters and, you know, fans. And I just thought, okay, let's do another, you know, we can do another run. And that ended up turning into seven, you know, seven, like, r- releases of it. Yeah, for me it was, you know, that was a corporate collaboration, but it really came from a place of love, you know? It was like everybody that I did it initially because of my price points and my fine artworks were not affordable to the average, you know, student or working person. And I wanted to I wanted to offer something that allowed just my fans and my supporters to collect something that was in like an affordable price point. Yeah. So everything around it was like from a place of love. Yeah, I mean, I'm not opposed to corporate and I think that existing within those spaces can can work if you do it with mm-hmm. real intention because yeah. ultimately we are all consumers absolutely <laughs> you know yep absolutely. we all we all have our favorite products our favorite things that we use to exist or enhance or amplify or feel so yes. yeah i like to exist in those spaces sometimes and i'm not opposed to that well we're going to get into your favorite beauty products but before we do i want to talk a little bit about this archetype of the black, brown, alt girl, right? Because mm-hmm. that's kind of, I mean, I feel like I saw it first with you. In terms of that kind of like alternative style, when you were doing it, had, did you see anyone else doing it? Yes. I think that I saw it before me. I saw it in the generations before me. Mm-hmm. I saw it with TLC. Mm. I saw it with Missy Elliott. Yeah. I saw it with Aliyah. I saw it with, you know, all of the different kind of like alt girls of like the 90s and the times that I was doing it I didn't see it as much Mm -hmm. and I remember a lot of people questioning me and being like what's going on like (laughs) (laughs) what are you doing this is weird you know which is funny because it's like we're all inspired by that music so it's like the visuals on that were so strong so I think that I have to give credit you know where it's due it's like the women that came before me I saw it in them as a very young child. Khalees also. Khalees. I saw it in in Khalees. I saw it in Mm -hmm. these women that came before me. And I attribute my weirdness to elements of them. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I've already always had like a weirdness to me. But I think that seeing it in them allowed me to be also alternative. And maybe my way, like growing up in England and being influenced by like The Cure and influenced by kind of like alternative British culture and like within more of a rock and roll space more of a punk space having like knowledge of people like Susie Sue and you know like just these kind of like alternative spaces within the black community and the white communities Mm -hmm. and you know throughout different spaces I think that allowed me to just be like oh I can express myself even though in my town that's not (laughs) the way we grew up we're very like chavy like football culture like you know, rude girl culture, tracksuits, trainers, like slip baby hair and like, you know, you know, a little bit of gold tooth, a little bit of that kind of style, but being a bit more like on the side of punk and alternative rock and roll, that wasn't really there. But when I look at those who came before me and I recently did a shoot actually with TLC for Good American, I did the photography and the creative oh, direction yeah. for that. I think one thing I had to say to them was like, without you, there would be no me. Because baby me saw you doing, you know, all that kind of like black futuristic. like Yeah. What was the album called? Fan Mail? I think so. Yeah. Fan Mail. Has that campaign come out yet? It's out. It's oh been gosh. out for a while. I think it came out about six months ago. Okay. I I'll need send to, it to I you. I need to revisit it. I saw the Skims work that you did. Yes. Yeah. Incredible. That was also really like I got to exp- uh, really explore like futurism in there as well. Yeah, and so within strong. like a very like diverse cast, I got to cast the campaign as well. And it was really. Making Skims cool. Yeah. It was, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and I love Skims product, but mm-hmm. in terms of the creative, like pushing it, your, you know, talent there is really felt. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. I mean, shouts to the team. Like 
we pushed it and and we got an amazing result i think you know the 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 team there they already ex- they already have like such their own specific identity you know and i think bringing their identity and mind together to just really create a conversation cool, yeah. it was cool yeah so your beauty look mm-hmm. i mean incredible and the reason why i'm personally so inspired by your approach to beauty is because it's beauty beyond looking pretty for the male gaze right right it's mm-hmm. beauty as art essentially yeah. mm-hmm. could you break down your look for us like even just what you've got going on today because I mean I've always loved the way that you do your lip liner I love the way you do your eye makeup but it's just even just what you've got going on now is so interesting thank you I mean for me it's never really planned it's okay. always in the moment I'm just you know I usually do my own base and I usually do my art you know but today we did the interview so I went to my favorite makeup artist Jaime Diaz and we did the base so I always do the base with Jaime when I have like in a show or an event or an interview or something but when it's just me I'll do everything myself and I just build out like a clean base and then I love to play that's my thing it's like how do I feel today what mood am I in? Mm-hmm. And I'll, you know, build out the eye and I'll do an eyeliner or I'll do some sort of like, you know, I might play with a jewel or two if I feel yeah, like these it. these jewels on your face are amazing. Thank you so and much. And then you've got like two sparkly like decals across your nose, which like looks so beautiful. These are actually um, Simi Hayes. Oh, yeah, okay. you know who else yes, they've got? Yes, yes. They, I'm really enjoying their stuff right it's now. Really cool. Yeah, I love them. And these are actually supposed to be for the lid. They're supposed to be uh, liners. Mm-hmm. So I think it's like the rave culture. I, th- I can't remember the actual name of it. So maybe not rave culture, but it's like an ode to rave culture. Yeah. And they have like special liners, but I use them in different places. Sometimes I use them for the cheek or I'll use them for the nose or the eyebrows or the eyeliner, yeah. however I'm feeling that day. So that's just me like playing, you know? Um, so are you kind of just like, look, cause I would get this eyeliner thing and I would just put it right above, <laughs> right by the lash and I wouldn't even think about it, you know? And I think most people would do the same. Mm-hmm. What do you think it is about your approach to beauty that allows you to like almost look at your face as a canvas, right? Mm-hmm. Like, cause I don't, I don't think about my nose. It's just there. I don't yeah. think about adorning it with interesting things. Mm-hmm. I think adornment is a beautiful word. And I think that it's very fitting. I think that growing up within a very multicultural experience, I saw a lot of the kind of gods and goddesses and deities of like Hinduism Mm -hmm. and Buddhism and and you know like the ancestral kind of expression from even all the way originating back to Africa there's so much adornment and I think that for me this is probably like an extension of that it may not have like necessarily the spiritual kind of like you know like the nose adornment or the eye adornment Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily like resemble a certain ritual or spiritual aspect Mm -hmm. but it's just more for me like an honoring to Mm -hmm. you know my ancestors and my ancestral cultures basically Mm -hmm. so I think that's really what I'm doing I'm I'm playing and I'm I'm working throughout just like my artistic expression because this is really how I see the world like the way that I dress the way that I make my work you've seen my work so it's like hyper color hyper abstract Mm -hmm. like existing within multiple dimensions it's not necessarily quiet (laughs) you know so I think for me it's like I'm doing the same thing here just with like Mm. my expression and I just I just play a lot Mm. with different kind of ways of of being even this like a little bit of red you have under the eyeliner on the bottom it's so unique and interesting did you just think like let me just try some red here like what well I'm like trying to get to like what's the thought process I think a lot so it's not (laughs) like as much as I play I also utilize inspiration Mm -hmm. I also also utilize just like I think a lot about what I'm doing the red actually comes from a movie I watched like many years back actually I think it's called Lady Vengeance 
It's by a Korean director. I forget his name, but he's done... It was the third installment of a trilogy. The first installment was a very famous Korean film called Old Boy. Yes. Yes, so that was the first installment of the trilogy. I think the second one was called Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, and I believe the third one is called Sympathy for Lady Vengeance. So it's a story about a woman that was wrongfully imprisoned. It's a psychological thriller. The story itself is about a woman that was wrongfully in prison and her daughter was kidnapped and she goes through kind of the it's all vague because I watched it a a while ago or like quite a while ago but in the storyline she's released from prison or she escapes prison and she takes revenge and she goes on this kind of wild storyline where she she takes back kind of her power and I don't remember if it was a happy ending. If it's a Korean thriller, probably not. Probably not. But I remember in that film, she applies the red to her eyes and there's a conversation about why she does it. And I think she says something along the lines of, like, I'm afraid that people will think I'm too good. Something like that. And it was basically speaking about the fact that she had a good heart. But I think because of that, she'd been taken advantage of or because she felt that her weakness allowed people to, you know, her perceived weakness, Mm -hmm. which was actually just her good intention, her good heart and good Mm -hmm. spirit. I think that people were kind of taking advantage of her for that. And I think at that point, I was in a very vulnerable moment in my life. I was going through a lot and I was in a very much a stage of healing and I felt that in that moment, my my kindness was being taken for a weakness. Well, just as you were telling the story, I feel like I can see a lot of parallels in terms of your exterior presents as extremely, I guess what I mean to say is before today, before we met and spoke, I didn't know how you were going to be. And you're so just delicate and <laughs> soft and kind mm-hmm. and quite gentle, but your exterior is so strong. Mm-hmm. Um, So I can kind of see how it's almost like an armor or this kind of like protection Mm -hmm. to like let people know I'm kind and gentle and sweet, but also don't try it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's true. I think that there is a form of armor to it. I Mm -hmm. think there is a form. Yeah, a lot of people say that when Mm -hmm. they meet me. They're like, oh, whoa, I thought you were going to be, you know, like quite intimidating. Yes, yes. No. I can be if I need to be, (laughs) you know, it is what it is. Like, (laughs) we need to turn up, let's go. But I think really my natural state is very, very soft. Mm. And yeah, I'm like, it's probably like one of those creatures you find in nature where it's like they have the kind of colourful wingspan or they have the, you know, the big like headpiece to kind of push away predators. It's maybe something like Mm -hmm, that. mm -hmm. But I am very half and half. It's like... I can give what I need to give, you know, within safe and loving environments. My true natural state comes out. I'm soft, I'm loving, I'm kind. But yeah, if I need to protect myself, then absolutely will and can. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. for sure. I love the way you do your lip liner. Thank you. It's so interesting. What sparked this? What was the inspiration? I don't know. I think that it's probably coming back to just experimenting and playing you know I think usually we're kind of using more neutral lip liners Mm -hmm. and you know shaping the lip and making it pouty and cute Mm -hmm. and I think that I do love a cute moment I do love to be cute but I think it's just more of like stepping into that area of extremism and just probably more of an ode to goth culture and I don't necessarily suit like an all black lip even though I do love that look, when I when I do like all black lip, it doesn't really, well, in my opinion, all my friends are like, oh, it looks good. But I'm like, it's not quite like what I want, you know? So I think that maybe it's just an ode to like goth culture in that sense of like, we have the black line there, but we're also still like cute and pretty as well. Yeah, with the gloss mm-hmm. in the middle. I love it. Now, when you, you take off your makeup and you do your skincare routine, Mm-hmm. What are your like must have products? Like what's the skincare like? I'm learning. Okay. Yeah, it's been a process. It's been a journey. I used to be one of those girls back in the day that we would sleep with my makeup, makeup on, on and just wake up and then wash my face with like a bar of soap. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, okay. I didn't really learn. I didn't. My mother's very 
like natural and neutral mm-hmm. and she didn't really teach me anything about that because she didn't know. Mm-hmm. So for me it was all been a learning experience through my adult life and just like through friends and mm-hmm. now obviously online you can learn so much. So I'm still learning but, you know, I go home, I I know that I... I double cleanse. Okay. I, yes, I'm double. I'm a double cleanser now. From from a bar soap the day after sleeping in makeup to double cleansing, you've right. come a long way. I've come a long way, <laughs> and you know the results. It, it's, we're making progress. Yeah, you have um, beautiful skin. Thank you so much. I think it's just really been a journey for me, and I'm still learning. I'm experimenting and I'm trying, and I have great people that I'm working with that are just you know you've always got to give credit to your kind of people that are doing your facials and 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 so on and I'm working with a couple of really great women that are helping me and guiding me and mentoring me and yes. like finding what that looks like yes. for me so who do you work with here in LA I work with Lisa Kardashian she's been great for me and we've been on such a beautiful journey with the skin I've been working with Mina Karam in London both of those women I really love to just give credit because I don't get to see them that often because I'm always traveling Mm -hmm. but they'll always be mentoring me and telling me you know cash this doesn't work for your skin don't do the oil don't eat dairy you know those are the things that don't work for me and just removing things like that has been such yes such a great help I mean you mentioned that you stopped drinking coffee and you're now a full-time matcha matcha drinker matcha matcha girl girl. and your skin has been so much better since cutting out caffeine yes I think I saw like something online that was like coffee cortisol levels and I was just like wait I really am the girl that will get up in the morning and just drink sh- like coffee straight away and just That's like get me. into the day yeah. yeah but you have beautiful skin so I don't think you need to cut it but maybe it could be better <laughs> no it could you're at peak level don't oh, worry you're there you. for me it was bad though so mm. I as soon as I cut the coffee and I don't know if it was the cortisol it's just like it was just not probably being as healthy as I should have been and then with that, I just noticed changes. I cut dairy at the same time. So everything just changed. And mm-hmm. from there, I've kind of been like, oh, this works. Let me see what else I can do. Are you a fragrance wearer? I am, but I'm living in different spaces with fragrance right now. I'm like experimenting with a lot of essential oils. Yes, I love I know. I'm really feeling that so, right now. Yes. But then also I have a really beautiful Jean-Paul Gaultier fragrance and I've been wearing that one quite frequently and it's it's beautiful. Yes. Well, I saw you were at the Jean-Paul Gaultier event and yeah. that like a very early work from Jean-Paul Gaultier was an inspiration to you as you were creating. Mm-hmm. And then to just be there with Jean-Paul Gaultier, I mean, that's incredible. I know. It was such a full circle moment for me to have that actually. It was just... It was so beautiful to be able to just stand there in the fitting room with the whole team and just picking the dresses and picking the iconic print and Mm -hmm. knowing that, you know, really like as I was very much beginning my journey, this was one of the key moments for me of of like inspiration and and knowing that I didn't have the passion for school or the traditional school system but when it came to a designer or an artist that I actually truly admired and felt like their work was something that made me feel something it was like I was able to produce a project that had enough power in it to bypass all of the like systems of like not having the grades to get into school and not having, you know, that was just such a full circle moment for me. And it felt, it was very rewarding because yeah. baby me never even began this journey with the intention to like stand in those rooms or to, to do those things. It was just like, I just want to do my thing and make what I can, but coming where I come from, if you could see it, I don't think any of us ever thought that we would be able to do anything at all. Right. Do you have advice for people listening that are at the beginning of their creative journey and maybe feeling discouraged for either not having their work recognized or just the struggle of trying to finance your life while also trying to make money as a creative? Yes, I think that the first thing I would say is just beyond anything. It's like take it easy on yourself. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. Mm -hmm. Whatever is meant for you will come to you and it might not be tomorrow, but it's coming. Mm. And I think that if you just continue on with your heartfelt passion for your work and you take time and you take it easy and you find ways to support yourself, maybe outside 
of the creativity if you don't have it like that if you know you don't have that external support from other places and you need to be the person putting food on the table maybe try and find a half and half way to do it because mm. now that I look back I think that's something that I probably wished that I did because I struggled so much probably to the point of like unnecessary struggle <laughs> you know there were times that I was starving like I was so hungry wow. And I was like covering rent, but I couldn't feed myself. Mm. And I was like losing weight. And like when you don't eat, you can't think. And when you don't, you know, like I was like putting myself through like unnecessary levels of struggle. It's kind of romanticized though for artists in a way, isn't it? It really is romanticized in so many ways. And now that I can put food on my table and my family's table, I look back on that in a way of like, yeah, I got through it and I did it. But actually... As a young person trying to survive, I lived in this country and live in this country with no family or support. So it's like everyone's in England, you know, so it's like being out here and just trying. I think for me, it's like I look back on that and I think about it and I'm like, you could have maybe just gone and got like a little side hustle job or something like and made sure that you were good. Right. as well as did this because I think I think especially as landscapes have changed and the economy is changing and and the way things are now it's like make sure that you're good that's my advice mm -hmm. make sure you're okay mm -hmm. and like Take do what you gotta yourself. do yeah. you know if you want to like go work at that cafe go work at that little place do that job because actually there's beauty in that too mm -hmm. and there's inspiration in that too and actually you might make like a little you might have that like social interaction that you might be lacking when you're holed up in your studio mm. and like really trying to find all the answers like the answers are everywhere mm -hmm. so like go go take care of yourself and find inspiration in everything you do because there's beauty in all of these different aspects mm -hmm. of life mm -hmm. and i think from that it's like one, make sure you're good, make sure you're taking care of yourself. And then like, yes, allocate time to your passions and like give yourself the grace of making mistakes. And like, don't worry if things can be perceived as a failure to the outside world. Like, mm -hmm. be okay with trying, because trying is key. Doesn't matter like what you're doing, as long as you're not like hurting yourself or hurting other people or making anyone feel bad. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, do your thing. Like, whatever's coming from your heart, stay true to yourself and just, like, do what you got to do to, like, get out that expression. Because I think a subject that's coming up a lot nowadays is, like, cringe, you know, like the cringe factor. Right, right. And specifically that part of being successful, the path to being successful means you will be cringe at some point. You're going to be cringe. And embrace it. Like, be cringe. Like, <laughs> if you've been cringe, like, that's that's cool. But I feel like you have never been cringe. I mean, do you, do you ever look back at moments in your career, or even beauty choices you've made, and think, like, this was a mistake. I shouldn't have done this. There's no mistakes yeah. and there's no regrets. Right, right. But I have been cringe. Like, I look <laughs> at a lot of my stuff. I'm like, wow, you really pushed it there. And like, <laughs> God, what were you doing? But what did you think was cringe? I'm so curious. There's so much. There's really? so much cringe. I'm yeah. like so surprised by that because I feel like you've all you've like, I would never associate you with that term. I know. And like, but you it's, know what it is? I think cringe is kind of like try hard. You know, and I've That's never true. That's true. seen you as that. No, I've never tried hard. Like, I don't care. You're always yourself. You always I'm show up as yourself. I'm always myself. I'm yeah. always going to be myself. Yeah. Or not. Like, there's times I haven't been myself to try and, like, not necessarily fit in. But there's, like, I think what's cringe to me, I think what really stands out as cringe to me is the times that I was trying to really, like, limit myself and pull back. Mm -hmm. from who I really am mm -hmm. I feel like my true expression has always been pretty extreme like you know I'm just I'm left field I'm avant-garde in many ways I'm just like weird you know I'm different in that sense but I think that when I see pictures of myself where I'm feeling like oh that's so cringe is when I was trying to like not be that yeah. So it's like the times that I was trying to wear like a denim short and like a bare face moment and be like in, like in L.A. and being like, oh, I'm trying to like limit myself because maybe at those times some people made me feel bad about being so extreme. Right. Whereas like in London, like you can kind of do what you want. Yeah. 
But LA beauty, I mean, LA beauty and fashion culture is sort of boring. I mean, it's, I feel like that's fair to say. Is that, is that rude of me to say? It's definitely only, not rude. Having that's only your, been here six months. That's your opinion. And yeah. like, I think you came from New York where it's right. like everything is just so like. So much more dynamic. So interesting. Yeah. But I think that's just a higher concentration of people in one place. That's also I true. I think there's a lot happening behind closed doors of yeah. here in LA yeah. where it's like, I don't leave the house. Yeah, you all know you cool I mean? people stay inside. We do. We're not. <laughs> You're not so hanging out I'm in West Hollywood. No. Eating no. lunch. No. no, I'm not there. Unless like a couple of friends in town, I'll step out and whatever. But I think, yeah, I think in LA, there's a lot of things happening, but it's just like, I think there's a lot of things happening behind closed doors that, mm. Maybe like in New York, I just got back two days ago. So for me, I'm like, it's like a visual feast. Like you're seeing everything and it's so cool. And I would say LA is definitely more of a different expression, but I can agree. It's definitely not, it's not New York and it's not London. You don't get as much visual stimulation by way of like eye candy. You know, you can just be anywhere in New York and you'll see people walking by like teenagers, kids, like anyone. And you're like, that's cool. Like you get inspired. Whereas in LA, I feel like I don't get that like visual. St- like if I'm walking around the Grove, it's like. Girl, not the Grove. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I have to pick like the least, no. the least cool place I'll in LA. I'll show you to some spots. So yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. I'm like, I need to see like LA through, through country. Yeah. Size. I'll show you where it's at. Like, cause where I go, they're turning it. They're turning it. Really? So, yeah. Okay. I need to hang out with you. Yeah. Yeah. Come out. We'll, yes. we'll, I'll show you something. Yes. Now, I feel like I would love if you did more in the beauty space. Yeah. I feel like you've done so much in fashion, really cool stuff in fashion, whether it's designing or creative directing. If you were to do something in beauty, like create a product, mm-hmm. what would you want to create? It's an interesting question. And I think that for me, I'm very interested in the eye. Mm. obviously Mm -hmm. so I think anything that's that kind of existing within the space of the eye I would love to do something with eyeliner probably Mm. and we've had some talks there's been some conversations about you know potentially doing Mm. kind of eyeliner collab and I could so see that like by Rado, I feel like it's killing it right now. I feel like I could so see like a Kesh by Rado. Okay, I'm going to have to check it out yeah. for sure. I think I'm always interested in that space. I think just like I said, you know, coming back to that kind of sympathy for Lady Vengeance red, mm-hmm. you know, existing within kind of like mm. maybe some palettes, maybe some stuff for people to create more of like an extreme look. I think that I'm definitely interested in like doing something within that space. It just has to be right because I'm I'm super careful about my collaborations you know I don't do many because when I do them I do them so it's like I think that yeah for me it's like just finding the right one yes yes and what do you want to see more of in this year like what do you want to see more of from the beauty industry what do I want to see more of hmm or even just from you know clients that approach you I mean you get access and insight into so many brands, beloved brands. Do you feel like people could be pushing harder, could be doing more interesting work, could be doing stuff in different digital spaces? I do think that people could always, I think there's always room for expression. I think that I want to see people be a little bit more careful with what collaborations and what kind of situations are happening. Because I think that it can, it's, it feels a little bit like a free-for-all right now. There's just so much happening. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, is this exciting? Mm-hmm. Is this is this just for the clicks, the likes, and the purchase? Or is this actually because there's real a real story behind it and real mm-hmm. intention? And I would love to see more intentional collaborations happening and, like, more stories, like, more, like, truth within these kind of collaborations because I understand everybody's trying to shift product and it's like everybody's got yeah. these kind of numbers on TikTok and it's got these kind of numbers on on Instagram and online but I think it would be nice to see people just being a little bit more intentional and a little bit more careful about what's being put out there because otherwise it just feels like this kind of like mishmash of just like oh release 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 and it's like where is, I mean, there are some, but I would love to see like something, something more intentional. Like for instance, uh, my friend, Alexa Demi, she's an actress. She's a, yes, you know, of course, yeah. from Euphoria, Maddie. Mad, Miss Maddie. Miss Maddie. She did, did you watch Euphoria? Yes, I did. I feel like, well, is she like the character? What? Quite intense. Oh, 
Alexa is the sweetest. Oh, really? I mean, yeah. <laughs> she, she plays that role extremely well. No, no. Alexa is like me. It's like she's half and half. She's like yeah. half, you know, she's just such an angelic energy and like the sweetest, mm-hmm. most loving, caring, kindest mm-hmm. angel. But obviously, you know, if you yeah. turn up, like, yeah. she knows she knows how to handle herself because Alexa also has worked very hard and, mm-hmm. and she has faced many obstacles herself. So... You know, she's she's such an amazing, an amazing person. And for me, it's like her collaboration with Mac was really intentional. It was amazing. Her yeah. mom used to be a makeup artist yeah. for Mac, yeah. you know, like yeah. Ro- Rosie is like been doing makeup for years. And I think that that for me was an amazing collaboration because you saw the truth behind it. Mm-hmm. And that's why. You know, I obviously she's my friend, but it's like I support that because there is a storyline. And I think just I would love to see more of that within the beauty industry and within makeup or skin or anything, you know? Right. A hundred percent. Right. Versus just throwing your name on something because you can. And, like, you know, I know that Alexa was involved in like the packaging and the coloring and the, you know, she every, put, every put real aspect, intention. Yes. So I, I loved that. And I always love collaborations and projects with intention and real authentic storyline behind it you know I love that how do you relax like how do you recharge how do I recharge I think I meditate yeah do you use an app is it like self-guided I do different techniques I go through variations of variations of different techniques I learned a certain technique from a humanitarian in India called Amma she's known as like the hug the hugging saint so I've learned one of her techniques that I utilize I would love to do it on a daily basis I'm not quite there yet but it's the place that I go to when I'm really trying to find my center again because my life is so busy and chaotic it's like I'm just always you know on the go I think for me when I go back to Amma's like I am meditation it's called I really find a sense of relief and peace Mm. and I find myself coming back to myself when I do that. Is there a specific mantra in the meditation or like something that you're supposed to repeat to yourself? It's like a variation of steps but it's harder to be able to say what it is it's something that you kind of have to learn because it's it's not that complex but it is just like a series of steps that involves exercise and then mind work that allows you to kind of like come back to home, come Mm -hmm. back to self, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's really like my key way of like relaxation, even though meditation can be extremely challenging because of the way that our minds work nowadays. I always feel relaxed after the fact of doing it. Yeah. So you're not binging on reality TV and like eating chips at home to relax? I mean, yes, but not reality TV, (laughs) like anime. Anime is your thing. Okay. Anime is my, you know, there's the one way of like self-care and meditation mm-hmm. and yoga and that stuff. And then it's like, you know, when it's that time to like really veg out and switch off, it's like, yeah, I'm going to order some food and I'm going to watch anime. Or I'm going to watch Powerpuff Girls. Or I'm going to watch something and just chill in my house and just like, I love kind cartoons. Yeah. Just to like turn your brain off. You yeah, know. you need it. It's so important. You can't always be on the go. Yeah. And there's like beauty and entertainment. That's why it's a billion dollar industry. It's right. like there's storylines behind everything. Mm-hmm. And it's like we are always, like I said, I'm asking for storyline within collaborations and projects. So it's like I want to see storylines within cartoons or anime or TV or even real, like, you know, like reality TV. There's a storyline. People are mm-hmm. telling a story there. So I think that's the beauty of it. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, you're you're so inspiring to me and to so many other people. I'd love to hear if you've met people that have been inspired by your work, like if supporters come up to you, like what's what if there's an interaction that stood out to you of someone that you've inspired? Hmm. I mean, this or like how it feels even just to be recognized, because I'm sure it happens, you know, people probably recognize you and come up to you. Does it feel strange? Does it feel natural? Does it feel... I think it feels natural at this point just because it's been... You're used to it. Yeah, I'm used to it. You know, I started my career, like, when I was 16. I've just been... I'm just used to it by now. I think it's always an honour, 
you know, I think that to be able to provide some kind of, I think it comes down to like if you're if you're inspired or if you're you are admiring or whatever, it's a good feeling. To be, it's an honor to create a kind of good feeling for somebody else mm-hmm. by them, you know, receiving my work or the work that I do. I think for me, it's always an honor. Sometimes, you know, I am a, you know, I am also quite shy as well. So it's like being approached at certain times, I can tend to just, I'm very introverted in sense. Mm-hmm. So it's like, sometimes I'm like, oh, um, <laughs> okay, hello, yeah. hi. But I, for me, it's always an honor. And I always value every single person that comes up to me and approaches respectfully and just has, you know, says what they have to say. Cause for me, once again, it's like, without you, there's no me. I create art for myself, but I also share that art. Right. And that art is then received by other people. And to have a positive feedback from somebody is just always such a beautiful yeah. experience and feeling. And yeah, I'm always, always just, I'm always grateful for that. I love that. Final question for you. Yeah. When do you feel most beautiful? I feel most beautiful when I am making somebody else smile or feel happy Mm. or feel good in themselves or I'm offering some sort of support or I'm just like uplifting. I think for me that is like when I feel the most beautiful. I think that I think there's nothing better than like kind of offering love in -hmm. some sort of way. You know, I think for me, that's when I feel most beautiful. I also feel beautiful when I create and I listen to the music I'm making or I look at the art that I've created or the piece that I'm working on or I'm feeling inspired by the kind of process. I feel beautiful then, but I think the most beautiful I feel is when I'm like uplifting another person or helping another person. Because I think we're living in a world right now where it's like so many of us are like individuals, you know? And it's like we're living in a very like individual state. And I think that offering like love to another person and like seeing that love being received and seeing someone's someone's spirits being uplifted and like real love, not fake love. I think that always makes me feel beautiful because it's like, well, I know that that person feels better in some way or shape or form now. And that for me is like that's when I feel the most beautiful. I love that. Being in service to others. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much for sharing so beautifully on on, in this conversation. It's been such a pleasure to just get to know you and your inspirations. So thank you. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be on the show.